Good night, mates. How the bloody hell are ya? I do hope you're well. Hope that in the madness of the world currently, you're at least finding a uh, a course through the turmoil against the wind, the battering. Um, this is in the back of my head podcast, episode fifty-one. Episode fifty-one. We're nearly at fifty-two. That's nearly a year's worth, baby. It's a creative podcast, a weekly little a weekly little journal where I talk about what the fuck's on my mind regarding creativity, the world, fucking whatever. Uh, get yourself a coffee, mate. Let's kick off. We're going to do a quick little recap. One of my favorite musicians, uh, one of my favorite folk musicians at least, one that has a very nostalgic value to me because it was spinning, these records were spinning on my my dad's record player when I was just a tot, when I was a small boy. Can you imagine me smaller? That's how small I was. Nick Drake, uh, who I assume Drake took his name from. (laughs) This dude was a, a sad tale a very sad tale and the quintessential quintessential um troubled uh artist tortured artist the quintessential tortured artist that is nick drake he was born in 48 in burma moved to the uk and attended a few colleges he was actually into sports at the start um sprinting rugby yada yada great you know he was getting scholarships he was getting he was like captain of the teams he was doing great he had a bright future ahead of him if he just kept running (laughs) but he was also playing music with his mates forming bands he's playing saxophone guitar piano i think guitar came later he was playing saxophone i think you know he was playing some r&b covers some rock and roll some blues you know as was the time as was the style at the time that's where they all fucking started that's uh, the Beatles, the Kinks, name any of those bands. They all stay on the same at that point when they all started because they're all just ripping off black musicians and barely crediting anyone. Bunch of fucking English cunts. What do you expect? <laughs> and then this line stood out to me of this, of this period in his life when he's at school. His tutors found him bright but unenthusiastic and unwilling to apply himself. Now, I relate. I relate to that. I'm sure you do too. I'm sure many people out there relate. Oh, he's clever. He's got a good... He's got a big old brain on his on his shoulders. He's bright. He's smart. He's got a beautiful future ahead of him. If only he would fucking apply himself. I've heard that too many times. <laughs> and he was signed to Island Records at the age of 20. And released his first album, Five Leaves Left. And already, my reading of this is that trouble had already started brewing. He was seen by some producers. And they were like, man, this, this kid's got it. I love your stuff, kid. But we have to polish it up. We got This is a marketable. This is, we can't sell this. This is gonna, this is gonna be scaring the hose. <laughs> we gotta put some shine on it. We're going to make this a little more poppy. And so they did. And the reviews were shite. And the sales were shite. It was poorly marketed. His first album, Five Leaves Left, did terribly. And it seemingly already had an effect on his mental health at that stage. That feeling of, oh shit, something's happening. My art, my soul has been seen and is being out there and put it out there into the world. And the world is saying, nah. (laughs) <laughs> nah, mate, not into it. The album title, Five Leaves Left, as well. This is interesting. Where that name comes from is from Rizzler cigarette papers that he was smoking at the time. And when you get down to the fifth, the fifth paper, the last five papers, it's printed on there. Five Leaves Left. You better get yourself some more papers. If you want to keep smoking, baby, if you want to look cool, you better get yourself some more papers. But also at that point, hauntingly, I 
I really, you know, we hoped that unplanned. He only had five years left to live as well when that album came out. How fucking crazy is that? Second album, same issue. Brighter later. They said, all right, that first one didn't work out. We're going to make it a little more poppy. We're going to add some more jazz influences. Oh, the people are going to love that. People are going to love... This one's it, Nick. This one's it, Nick. And it, again, reviews, shy. Sales, shy. And his mental health issues worsened. He was doing uh, performances on stage and just walking off halfway through. He was never he was never big on performing to people, but it was it was getting worse. And what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing from reading this, and I might be adding a little dramatic flair to it, but from what I've read about Nick Drake, it seems like the tortured artist went in as a poetic soul, just a poet, and got plugged into a machine, which is the industry. And spat him back out and said, nah, you're shy. You're not worth it. You're not making us any fucking money. You're not selling. And of course they would kill you. Of course they would strangle your soul. And so then his final album, Pink Moon, 1972, was a very different vibe. My favourite, I'm sure many other people's favourites. All of the people that I know who listen to Nick Drake, that's their favourite. He was determined to make a much more stark and minimalist album. And minimalist it was. It was just him, two days, or two nights, I think, uh, recorded this album. Just him and a guitar. His guitar was in pretty bad nick. (laughs) Pretty bad shape. And you can hear it. The strings are dull. Strings are dead. Things are fucking beat up. Things are fucking beat to shit. Sounds cool as fuck, honestly. He recorded the 29 minute album and then that was it better reviews terrible sales so he was already depressed at this point he was already on antidepressants at this stage but then he retreated to his parents home after completing pink moon where he was smoking an insane amount of fucking weed which is you know it can't be good <laughs> for you it can't be good for your mental health if you're already in that dark place Probably not as bad as being spat out by a fucking machine that way. And, um, yeah. Severe depression. Lost smoking weed on antidepressants. Withdrew from everyone. Withdrew from, from uh, obviously from public life, but especially withdrew from personal life. His friends, family. He was around. He wasn't really there. And then on November 25th, 1974, he died from an overdose of antidepressants. Age 26th. Not clear if it was suicide. Might have been an accident. But he wasn't doing good. But he gained critical acclaim. In a sense, this turned around. And in the videos that I've seen about this, they say, oh, it all turned around. After he was dead. (laughs) He gained critical acclaim. Um, When Pink Moon... Pink Moon was featured in a Volkswagen commercial boosting Drake's US album sales. So in 1999, Pink Moon came out in 72, 1999, 6,000 copies had sold in that time. And then Pink Moon comes out, it's featured in a Volkswagen commercial, and the next year has gone from 6,000 to 74,000. Unbelievable. If only. Oh, we all dream. We all dream of being in a Volkswagen commercial. Sad fucking time. Sad fucking time for Nick Drake. Quintessential tortured poet. Tortured artist. But who tortured? Who did the torturing? And was his tortured soul what made the amazing art? Or was this life a result of something else? This is a common obsession. I would say this is a cultural obsession that has cropped up many a time. The obsession with the tortured artist is an obvious trope, but uh, especially those that receive fame, acclaim, uh, the attention that so, oh, they so rightfully deserve. Once they're gone, once they're dead, 
I don't know where it started. I can't remember why where, I, where this came up. But I ask myself, is it sad? <laughs> is it sad that they don't get fame during their life? Is that is that the sad is that sad? The obvious answer should be yes. Yes. Why is it sad? And I want to kick this part off with a quote <laughs> from The Independent in the UK. I don't know when this was published, doesn't really fucking matter. This is just a headline. Nick Drake died 25 years ago in despair and little known. Today, his songs are hugely influential. But is it because they're great? Well, because he's dead. <laughs> now, obviously, I don't know how they said it. I don't know how their inflection was. I added a little bit of spice to it, but like... Kind of fucking. It's an insane question. <laughs> insane question. Was he actually good, or is it just? Is we just? Is it just because he's dead? So I guess my question is like, what, what? What kind of validation is fame? Is is record sales? Is the 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 public, the adoring critics? Is it the recognition recognition of your peers, of those that uh, inspire you that you would also like to inspire? Would this make you happy? Would this sort you out? I'm sure it would. Of course it feels good. Of course it feels great, I'm sure. To put out an album, to put out something, and and to have the world say, yeah, man, you did it. This is fucking fantastic. Of course that feels good. Of course that feels good. But any creative knows that recognition on for your work is not a cure. It's not a cure for your despair, for your self-doubt, for your imposter syndrome, for your depression. The fame, the recognition from even from your peers is very good and I'm not I don't want to take away from that. But it's not curing anything. It is a momentary blip. It is a little oh a little mmm a little oh that's nice. Oh, a little hot, a little hot bath. I'm gonna bathe in the hot bath and the hot waters of fame, of recognition, even for a second. Even for people such as myself who have not tasted any sort of fame, not tasted any sort of real uh, cultural recognition, rather just a local, local taste, local little, you know, people coming up to you at the end of a gig going, "Hey, that was nice, man." And you go, "Oh, thank you. Ah, oh, oh, I bathe, I bathe in your appreciation. Thank you so much." I just, I know a lot of artists, so I think it would be miserable, regardless. <laughs> I think I'd be miserable regardless. I reckon if I was, if I was uh, receiving that sort of praise 10 years ago, I'd be miserable still. I think we just love the fucking tortured artist. It's hard to say, obviously, because we don't know. We don't know what it's like in these people's brains. We don't know what it's like. But I know that we love the tortured artist narrative. We love fetishizing the tortured artist. We love fetishizing their pain because it makes their art good. It's all worth it for the art, isn't it? Isn't it? But I was thinking about this, and this is being cynical. Oh, God forbid. But is this a version of we're all temporarily embarrassed millionaires. If you have not heard that quote, uh, I can't remember where it's from, um, from a political scientist or scholar, I believe, talking about why there's no major um, proletariat, why there's no major working class um, force in the United States outside of more of like the... um, the civil rights movement and stuff like that. There was a lot more of working class solidarity in that. Um, but for a lot of people in the United States, there is not that working class solidarity. And the theory, this guy's theory behind that is, is because everyone thinks they are temporarily embarrassed millionaires. One day, baby, one day, I'm gonna be at the top. One day I'll be at the top. And then you all better watch out. One day, one day. And I was wondering if that's the same as um, in this. We're all temporarily embarrassed millionaires and we are all temporarily 
unfamous artists, unknown artists, underground artists. One day, don't give up. Even after you're dead, you might just make it. <laughs> but that got me thinking of like, there's a sense of it's deserved. This is a deserved response to your art. Your art is fantastic, your art is brilliant, and so therefore, at some point, even if it's after you're dead, it will get the attention it deserves. And I think that's bullshit. <laughs> I think that's shite. Death adds an extra layer. So I guess, oh god, I hate to be almost agreeing with it. I love Nick Drake, so don't get me wrong. I think Nick Drake is a brilliant artist. I think he was a brilliant, sensitive soul. I was gonna say genius. I don't know if that's the right word. I don't like that. I don't like that word. It makes it sound like they're a more. They're better at bearing their soul than others. That's a weird thing to say, isn't it? But in one sense, I am agreeing that the death adds extra layers of importance. It's a good. It's a good tale. It's a better story. It's a better story. But someone suffered for that story. And I don't like that. I don't think that's worth it. I don't think that's worth it just to give us the warm fuzzies. I don't like that. There's that. You can have you can have death as kind of the hook. The hook of your story. Or, you know, you're just the right person at the right time in the right world. There is chance. And that chance includes not only are you a good artist, but also are you a good marketing person? Are you extroverted, introverted? Were you meant to be born in a time when the internet existed and it's easier to get your music out? Were you born too late and you would have thrived in the hippie scene of the 60s? I don't know. But there is luck. There's a lot of luck involved. And now, in this day and age, you know, we're just throwing our shit into the endless ocean. There's a huge amount of luck in that. The algorithm might just one day say, Oh, baby, this is great. I'm going to take this and throw it to the world. No knowledge of what it actually is. No understanding of what it actually is. No understanding of its quality. I don't like the fetishization of the death. The better story. And it is a good story. I don't think that's worth it. Not for the art. I hate, I don't like that. You should suffer. You should suffer a miserable existence for your art. That makes good art. Fuck all that. Change of pace. You might have seen these boys. You might have seen these these lads on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, wherever. You've seen them around, I'm sure, because they look like they're a gimmick. These are men in their 70s from the UK. Very UK-focused uh, episode. My apologies. <laughs> um... Men in their 70s, doing rap, hip hop. And I was reading about these guys, um, Pete and Bass, Pete and Boss. Um, one of them was shown some hip hop by their granddaughter. And they were like, this is cool, this is sick. I wanna do some stuff. And they start putting out these tracks. And yes, when you first see it, you're like, this is, this is a bit of a goof, a bit of a gimmick. It's a gimmick that they are 70 year old dudes um, making hip hop. You know, it's a bit of a laugh. But then you actually listen to the lyrics. You know, like, these guys are fucking... Like, these guys are talented. Like, their, their flows are fucking crazy. Their delivery is strong, powerful, um, very entertaining. And their lyricism is brilliant. My favourite ones of them... Uh, so, Pete and Boss or Boss is, is... They do more, like, kind of UK gangster kind of shit. Thinking, like... Um, two smoking barrels, lock, stock, and two smoking barrels kind of kind of vibes, and then the Northern Boys, they they can be a little bit more silly, but especially um, the main one, Norman Payne, um, is doing hard hitting, very personal stories. His lyricism is brilliant. His expression of his pain and soul is brilliant, and I fucking love these guys, and I fucking love that these guys. They started this. In, the in their 70s. They started making this music in their 70s. And that, for me, now they've got recognition because they came out at a good time where, where, the, where the TikTok exists. But they're a perfect example for me about why are we creating? Why are we making art? Now to me, and I mentioned this on the previous episode, but it seems rather applicable once again, is that 
it's how I process the world. It's how I process my emotions, is I see things, I feel things, I experience just being alive. And my way of bookmarking each section, the way of, okay, that happened, now I move on to the next thing, is through art, making art. And that's what I see, that's what I see these guys are doing, is uh, especially Norman Payne, is he's lived a life. He's got some pain, he's got some thoughts, he's got some experiences, and he's expressing them and putting them out there. And it's a beautiful fucking thing. And it's an interesting thing to start at that age, like, it'd be a strange thing to go into it being like, oh, I'm gonna make it as a rapper, I'm gonna make it as a musician, or anything, pick anything. At the age of 70, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into it with the express intent of, quote-unquote, making it. No. You go into it being like, I just want to make some shit, mate. I've got some thoughts, I've got some feelings, and I want to put it out there to fucking make me feel better. It's not, the fame isn't going to fucking do anything. The success isn't going to fucking do anything. Getting to express yourself, maybe, will help you through those struggles, or maybe help you through those pains. They could potentially be a cure, but the success and the fame are not going to be a cure in any way. And to have that expectation as uh, the idea of success and then the counter being failure, that's just going to make things worse, right? To be really dramatic. To be really dramatic. The way I see the world, the way I see creativity and human beings in general, the way I see consciousness, what I see the point of this all is, is that the universe is cold lifeless until we give it meaning until we observe it until we just appreciate it a flower is beautiful it's gorgeous but it's sort of, it's just a thing it's just it doesn't really mean anything until we look at it and just go yeah nice that's great i think con i think we are consciousness is just the eyes the ears of the universe it's not my idea of state. I've taken it from other places, mainly Eckhart Tolle, but like, we are the universe observing itself. And so therefore, I sort of think it's our duty, it's our duty to view the world, to appreciate what we see, to appreciate life, and then make art. Art is the expression of that. It's actually our job. It's, it's your job as a conscious human being just make shit just for the fun of it just for the sake of appreciating the world appreciating what you see appreciating everything around you to appreciate yourself to help you process those emotions to give you solace it's your fucking job mate do it <laughs> or don't like it doesn't matter it's not important like it's not your job to sell records it's not your job uh, to get a bunch of views on TikTok. Nice. Little blips. A little bath. A little bath of appreciation. Ooh, yum, 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 yum. It's not your job. And it's not a cure. It's not a cure for the depression. I don't think the fame and the success is going to fix you. I don't like fetishizing the tortured artist. I don't think we should do that. And the death is a good story. I wish... He had been happy in his life. I don't care about the success. I wish he'd just been happier. I wish we were all just a little bit happier. Making art. I'm going to end on a different note today. I'm going to try and do this. Maybe not every time. But I want to find some poetry to read that you know, has some meaning has some symbolic uh, to the episode and in this case it's from a friend of my uh, from my dad a friend of my dad's that passed away um, some years ago um, Maurice Strangard I don't know much about this guy I don't know much about this guy I know that he worked in a hospital and that in the time between uh, patients and things he had to do there was a good bit of downtime and he started writing poetry later in his life and um, he's published. He just wrote it later in life, passing the time. And that's kind of all I've got. Like, that's the connection here. But 
My dad loves this poet. I love this poet. It was a friend of his. So I thought I'd read something. This is the nailing of the right hand. It's getting the nail through the right hand that I will find the most difficult. You see, once I got one foot nailed, right or left, it didn't really matter, then I had a kind of base to work from. The other could then be nailed without much difficulty. A nail can be held in such a way by the fingers of the left hand that the hammer holding right can drive it home. Then comes the difficult part. As difficult in its way, I suppose, as believing that the poor are to blame for their misfortunes. The nailing of the right hand. I have saved this particularly long nail, and I think that, with the hammer handle grip between my teeth, it can be done. You will appreciate that, once in this position, I will have no more to say. You, however, can tell me once more that you love me. That's The Nailing of the Right Hand by Maury Strangard. This has been In the Back of My Head podcast. I hope that you've enjoyed it. I hope that you're just happy making art, just kind of chilling. If fame comes sweet, but just... It's not why we're here. It's not why we're here. We're here to just make shit. I'll see you next time. Thank you.